Um, so, so the presentation I, I wanted to do was I just went to the, um, I'm also part of the Hawaii Farmers Union United, and we just went to uh, I just went to the state convention, and they had a lot of really good scientists there talking about um, all these high-level concepts. Um, does Does Master Joel want to talk now, or he, he's kind of missing for this? So what I what I put up here and why the thing that I thought would be most relevant to present to you guys since you guys have all been practicing is to connect the vocabulary of what the um, scientific terminology is to what we've been talking about. Because we often talk about FPJ and all this stuff, we have our own language. And I believe that one of the struggles with getting natural farming out is that it's a vocabulary issue. Okay. Like we're speaking French and these people understand yeah. Japanese, right? And we're saying the same thing, we're just saying it in a different language. So that's kind of what the presentation I wanted to give here a little bit. And the key to me, wealth and diversity is healthy soil, is kind of the bottom line of what everyone's saying. Like you have well fed diversity, and that is healthy soil, which then creates everything on top of that becomes healthy, right? This is doing this morning. Um, and I wanted to underline kind of a scientific effect, effectiveness of the solutions that we got. So I just, I just went to the conference, and this guy here is Dave Brown. He is kind of nationally being recognized right now as a forward thinker and a just leader in um, what, what he's talking about. So he goes around and lectures nationwide. And this is one of the first slides he talked about. Um, that, you know, if your grandparents are eating bacon and we're eating a product that's called bacon, it's not the same bacon. It used to be like lean stuff with good fat that wasn't pumped full antibiotics. And we eat that, and it used to be you could eat some bacon and be healthy. Nowadays, you go fry up that bacon, it's like fry it in like, you know, right away. And so the same thing, the nutrient value has just declined, declined, declined. And it's just a story that's even well recognized by all kinds of scientists, the USDA studies this. Um, but really what the answer is, this is Bob Schaefer, another super star in the um, bioreclamation, you know, bringing your soil back to fertility. And he's talking about growing a rhizosphere health and food quality. And so this is where I'm connecting the scientific um, words to this, is that when you go talk to a scientist and you say, oh, good, good, good. if you can say rhizosphere, you're immediately going to get their attention. What is the rhizosphere? It's the area right around the root. So it's, it's not... Oftentimes we go, we soil sample our field, right? And we want to correct the pH of our field, right? And so we go throw we're too acidic, so we throw calcium, or in this case we throw seawater, right, to alkalize it. But you don't need to do your whole field. You really need to worry about the rhizosphere and create a healthy rhizosphere. Because the way it works is if a plant, the, if you've ever seen that graph where there's the solubility of different minerals at different pHs, the plant will actually exude different sugars to change the biology. It will change the pH in that micro region and say it changes, puts out these sugars, the iron loving guys that solubilize that. Now the plant can get iron. It'll change the pH really low if it needs aluminum. All of a sudden it'll make your soil really acidic and now aluminum it can take up. So when we're trying to correct the pH in this general way, we're missing what nature is already providing for us in the rhizosphere. And so understanding that, that's why we put that diverse microbes out, because they go and they create this, they interact with the roots and create a healthy rhizosphere, which then grows high quality food. The other principles they had are basically um, maximizing biodiversity and maximizing living roots. This is coming from the scientists at USDA. This is um, Jen Kucera's presentation. He said, oh, USDA up there. Um, in 
and she's really talking about what is the key. Well, the key is biodiversity. So what is IMO? Biodiversity, right? So if we go to the scientists and we say we have IMO, they're like, well, whatever. But if we go to them and we say we have a biodiversity inoculant that we want to put into our soil, then now we're speaking the same language again. Um, and these are all the benefits we all know about these. You know, breaking disease, you know, you know um, increasing soil organic matter, increasing nutrient cycling, plant growth, um, and everything that comes from just biodiversity. Um, and this here, this was one of the more telling slides. This one on the left is, is from rich forest. And this one on the right is one where it was soybean monoculture. Now, you can see this one looks like a brick. And this one on the left actually looks kind of healthy, it's airy, it's all kinds of aggregation in it. What I noticed is that there's a trend happening with these guys that they're, they're really anti-monoculture. And for good reason. But what we have an upper hand on this that I believe in natural farming is, I, I later asked Dave Brown in the lunch line, I said, what if you can have biodiversity below with a monoculture above? And he looked at me and said, I don't know. How, how would you do that? Well, my answer was, so I, so I asked him another question. And I said, what, because he, he talked about these exudates, the things coming out of the roots to feed the biodiversity, and that's what he's getting. He's putting polycultures in there to feed different exudates to grow diverse biology. Right? You've got to have different food to have different microbes. <coughs> and so I asked him, what if I could get concentrated root exudates without and, and apply those to the field? Then I would have you know diverse microorganisms and diverse food. And he looked at me and said, How would you do that? <laughs> Fermentation. Fermentation. So what I came to realize by looking at these two things here was that what we have in natural farming are these two tools. We can put the biodiversity right on the top as, as the microbial biodiversity from this environment. We just take this biodiversity we captured, we put it into this environment. And then even though we're still growing a monoculture of soybean, we feed it an FPJ from sweet potato, from comfrey, from these different plants that we have. And now we've taken the biodiversity here, plus all the foods that would have come from a polyculture. Mm -hmm. And now we're able to get the efficiency of monocultures in, with, um, without monoculturing. Mm -hmm. And so I found this to be hugely interesting. And that's why I think uh, natural farming thrives in certain situations. And the whole key is this vast biodiversity. So we can get those inoculants, and each of the microbes within an acre, so it, you see this many cows outlined there? That's how much microbe there are equivalent weight in 2.3 acres. I think it's something, it's like a couple cows per acre of, if you took all the microbes and compressed them together, you have that many animals. So when you hear people talking about these systems where they're integrating grazing into cultures um, like Joe Salatin's methods, we actually have the cows grazing under the ground. <laughs> so if you come to a natural farming thing and you say, oh, well, where's the livestock in your monoculture thing? They're actually under the ground. Our microbes are doing all this grazing for us. And I thought this was one of the most telling slides here of the two principles I often talk about. She said, you got to protect your microbiology and you got to feed it. So when I often talk about natural farming, I say on one hand you have microorganisms and on the other hand you have foods. So we have our IM1 or LAB, those are the microorganisms. So in this case where she says protect, she isn't even aware of this inoculate. Right, coming in, we, we're, we're beyond protection. We're at introduction and then beyond that protection. 
and then the feeds, which come in by understanding the nutrient cycle and pretty much always putting FPJ, which is your root exudates, putting PRV, which is your acids to kind of help dissolve, as well as balance out your FPJ, and the OHN, which is always a medicine, right? So for us, we always need food plus medicines, and BRD is sort of a cleanser. You know, we gotta excrete our waste correctly. And so, via natural farming, we're, we're not only protecting, we're also introducing, and then we're always feeding. And these are the two basic keys of what she was talking about. How do you bring soil back to health? And these are the core principles of the methods we learned here. So they're talking a lot about the polycultures and the worms that come in from doing polycultures. But just by applying diverse IMO to the top of your surface, who has noticed that worms increase? Right? So by doing the same activity without necessarily the polycultures on top, because they're talking a lot about polyculture cover crops, and I, I do think there's value there. But he's showing, he's showing that by just doing that, we get this. We do the same thing without the polyculture, and we're getting the same effect. Yeah. So I think what we're on to is, in terms of research, we're right there. It's not you know, the, the, the tip of the spear we're like out in front. It's the air splitting in front of the um, spear being thrown at the target. And so I just wanted to show this slide here. This is one of the more striking slides that I think really made an impact on folks that this field is the same uh, conditions. They had a drought that year. Instead of getting seven inches of rain, they got two, which is crazy, that's a drought. I mean, we have so much more rain than them, it's, it's funny. But, but what happened here in the front was this is just the, the cash crop being sown. In the back, this is the cash crop that you can see the white wisps coming up above, plus five other um, cover crops. So this is a polyculture cover crop that they put in. So you'll see the same effect by via using IMO4. Right? The, the crops that you planted without that in your in your dead soil um, die in a drought. Whereas the ones that you put IMO4 are able to withstand. And it's that diverse biology that's bringing water into your soils. And, you know, in this case, obviously it's better covered when things grew in. But this is the leading edge research of showing, okay, where we sow these polycultures. But if you were able to get this same result back here, up here, without that polyculture, it's going to make your harvesting that much easier. Right? Because back when they have to do all kinds of sorting and other things. And so as a natural farmer, you can do this one in the front, where it looks like the one in the back, but you're able to pull off a much better crop than your neighbor who doesn't understand the diversity and then feeding the right crops. We're doing strong liquids. So in certain, certain applications, you just wouldn't cover crops because it's unnecessary? I always I always think that um, you should keep your soil covered. It's just like you don't want an open wound, so you should always cover it because naturally you don't want to grow a scab. So weeds will come in that are scabs to cover and things. So whether you know, put a band-aid, which is mulch, or you're going to put a living cover crop is always a good idea. But the importance of polyculture cover crops, for us, we're getting that same benefit via our IMO4. Um, and so again, behind her, I just, um, this is Jen talking about us, and I really like her shirt, it says soil. Um, and these, these are five test plots in the front where each of these were a single cover crop put in, planted by themselves. Then there's a small 10-foot row of sun hemp in there. And then in the back is all five of these crops combined. And this is at about six weeks of growth. And so they're, by using polycultures, they're, they're bringing the soil back to life, and this is what they're doing. But again, just to show you kind of the monoculture you know, what, what happens if you're not including that diverse biology, you just don't get the same result. And I thought this was also one of the most telling slides. Um, this, this was a hard hitter for me because he basically considered his four neighbors, or his three neighbors that are adjacent to his farm. The first guy is doing organic management, which um, is, you know, USDA organic. 
uh, he's killing, he's throwing down organic fertilizers, whatever those may be, and he is getting two parts of nitrogen per whatever unit this is in. Then his other neighbor is no-till, but low diversity, and he's getting you know a little bit more, about 20 times what his, um, his um, you know, the organic guy was getting this killing. Then the guy that's doing no-till with medium diversity and high synthetics, he's getting a little bit more diversity, or a little bit more nitrogen. But this bottom one is Dave Brown's one. He's doing no-till, high diversity, um, no synthetic fertilizer, plus livestock, and he's getting 281. Wow. So he's, that's like, what, 100%, almost 100 and whatever percent, or times more. Yeah. Hundred times more available nitrogen, and that's across the board for all of these things. These numbers are just off the charts compared. Wow. And this is the same thing you'll find with um, by using IMO. Mm -hmm. That the the basic idea is that you have sand, silt, or clay, mm -hmm. and in each grain of sand, there is more nutrients than could feed this entire island in one grain. But the problem is, it's in that grain, it's not next to the plant. And so by increasing the diversity and the biology in your soil, they're able to break that grain down and make it available to your plants. Mm -hmm. So all your NPK, which we continually throw on the soil, he hasn't thrown anything on his soil for the past 20 years, and he has this much in his soil. You think, oh, well, it's going to get depleted. No, the biology is actually breaking it out of the sand, silt, and clay when he's able to get those exudates, which is our FPJ, plus his diversity into the soil. So this is what he's doing to, to really crank it up. What's the last number? The last one is something organic content. I don't know what the WD stands for. Sorry. Um. Sorry, Jerry. Going back one, so the Gabe's thing was no-till, high density, High density, no synthetic, and livestock. Yep. And, and this is tested by some university here in Temple, Texas. So what he really got to at the end of his presentation, and unfortunately he kind of ran a little long on time, so and they're really no ten about the time, which is something I admire about them. Um, <laughs> is that he got to this mycorrhiza fungi build soil aggregates. So again, these are scientific terms that we need to start using, right? When we talk about IMO, it's like, oh, okay, what is that? Well, if you say, oh, well, this is concentrated mycorrhizal fungi, or a stimulant, a prerequisite for that to naturally appear, these are the guys that are motivated in terms of prebiotic, now you're able to say, and it's, and it's building soil aggregates, right? It's not making my soil rich or whatever. You can actually use these terms to say, okay, it's balling up the soil. When you see these soil balls, you say, oh, well, that's nice aggregation. It's happening from the thing. And this is why when you go gather your IMO, you want to gather it from a rich forest environment. Because I can just take starch, I can just take a thing of rice and put it right here on the table. But am I going to have mycorrhizal fungi that are real soil aggregates? No. I will have the nice cotton candy, but what you're trying to get is to go to those rich environments with those starches, capture the mycorrhizal fungi, and then introduce that to your other environment. And that's what's really going to make your farming work. He also then got to this, which is this is what I've been, um, was what I learned from Elaine really a lot. And this is why it what enabled me to understand the value of IMO and why to make it correctly. Why not just let the temperature shoot up the roof, you know, like why does Master Cho tell us keep low temperature? Mm -hmm. Because you're growing fungus. And if you can change the fungal to bacterial ratios, which is what this is outlining, you can see the results between this one and this one and it's different fungal to bacterial ratios. It's just undeniable. This is the thing when Ginger John followed Master Cho's process and his full house starts were twice the size as his best organic methods, that he got started dancing. 
because this is the results and this is the process we're going through is to change this fungus to bacterial ratio in our soils. The fungus is so vital to us and right now it's under assault. All of our emissions that we do, all of our land practices. Um, I was sitting with Steve Lund by the pool and I've been talking about the whole world's getting coated in petroleum. And so the, the fungus that used to symbiotically work with our forest is now cleaning. And it's cleaning all day and it forgot to feed the tree because it's like, oh, there's more mess to clean. I can't think about feeding me right now. I gotta clean before I can cook. And, and as he was saying that, I could like smell the jet fuel that's just present in our upper atmosphere that's raining down on us constantly and just assaulting the fungi everywhere. So globally, fungus it, or um, forests are declining. And it, I believe it has a direct relationship to this. We used to have nice abundant forests. As we kill off our fungi, we start to go back this way. And now we're like, oh, why doesn't the ohia tree grow? Why doesn't this oak just take over the forest like it used to? And it's because we killed off the fungus. And that is just leaving bacteria around. And that's why these methods are so important for us and everywhere. Um, and this was another key, key, key point that I thought was there, is majority of fertilizer, no matter what initial form, goes through microbes before the plant gets it. So it goes through microbes. So when we're there and we want to like throw chemical fertilizer or this or that, you need the microbes. Even if you are using a chemical fertilizer thing, you, if you kill off your microbes in your soil, you won't have as much results. Your fertilizer will be less effective every year. And it's because it goes through your microbes, no matter what initial form, always. And so understanding this and understanding why we want to build our soil and why we want to put rich microbes out there is to me like this, it's the whole reason, no matter what your farming style, you still gotta have your microbes. Well, the chemical salt fertilizers kill a lot of the soil life. I mean, the salts are poison, right? In, um, it depends, it all depends. I, I'm super non-dogmatic at the way I, um, when I'm, when I'm teaching natural farming, I teach as true to Master Joe's teachings as I can, but your actual practical, how you do it, how you make your bottom line, Everyone has a different style, um, and yeah, so that's what I found. Can you go back to the last slide for one second? Thank you. Yeah. So, and again, just looking at this field again, you know, this were the, these were the monoculture cover crops. Mm -hmm. This is the row of sun hemp, and then this is the polyculture thing happening here. So this is the reinforced uh, polyculture aspect that we get without necessarily putting polyculture above to maintain that efficiency. Um, I think that's all I have for that there. standing on the shoulders of giants, I really appreciate all these things I was able to gather. Um, sometimes I go to sleep and I wake up with a great idea, and I just like to think that it's you know, something else. Um, were they receptive to my ideas? I, I learned in my journey through natural farming not to tell people they're wrong or tell people that I have a better idea. So what I did with Gabe was I asked him a few questions. I asked, could you have diversity below without diversity above? And it made him kind of scratch his head and start thinking about it. And I asked him, could we make exudates without these polycultures? And again, he was like, how? And he said, fermentation. He started scratching his head and he's like, hmm. Because that's what's happening in the soils, right? We know that as nature. Um, and what I found in my journey with natural farming is, if you do it right, you cannot stop people 
from copying it. <laughs> How many people come to a no smell pig pen and go home and try to copy that as soon as possible? But you could go to him, just like when Master Cho came to Mike Dupont and he said, I got no smell pigs, and he laughed him out of his office. Right? But as soon as Mike Dupont went to Korea and he saw that, he was just crying. And he was like, oh, wow. And he couldn't stop my coupon today. Yeah. Um, he's not going to go back until you put in a, a wash down system. You cannot stop it. Because you witnessed it in action and somebody took the thing and you do it. So if people aren't listening to you and you say, oh, da, 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 no worries. Maybe one day say, oh, maybe you want to come to my farm or what the project I did in downtown Hilo, where I just went into the town and planted call right in the middle of town, and that thing was just pumping. Yeah. You know, so, so get a small area where people can see it. And let them come to you and ask a question. Say, oh, how come the call is so big? How come the banana fruit is so early? How come your old kids are coming back to life? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's always easy to do. I don't think I do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how you're comparing FPJ to an exudate, yeah. and then exudates are so specific for nutrient and mineral uptake. Is is the type of FPJ going to, at some point, when you get the science down, that's going to equal the exudate that the plant would want, or you're just talking about general exudate? Okay, so so the question was about the exudates, and um, are there specific ones that work? Well, basically, an exudate attracts what it needs. Yeah. Okay, so so why is FPJ in my mind analogous to these exudates? So number one is that they are produced without heat and without pressure. The only heat that is involved in that process is a natural heat that would occur in the soil, in nature. And it's the heat of fermentation. The only pressure that is applied is osmotic pressure, mm -hmm. which does not rupture the cell wall. It just osmotically pulls the best nutrients across and leaves everything, everything else in the plant. And you, you compost or discard that or feed it to your animals or whatever you're going to do. You're just getting the best juice that came out. So because you're producing without heat and pressure, these two things are unlike any other thing that I've seen out on the market that anyone else is producing. Everything else like producing regular fertilizer, high energy intensity, bound with salts. Um, and, and the third thing is that it's bound with sugar. Sugar acts as a preservative, but as soon as it's diluted, it now becomes another food. So in those three aspects, FPJ is superior. Now, what type of FPJ should you use? That's why Master Cho recommends different FPJs for different growth stages. That's why he also recommends certain plants at different times. I find just in general, something like a comfrey is loaded with a lot of things. It grows really well here. It's easy for me to get a hold of. Um, and the banana cake is another one that gives a whole lot of juice that's really easy, lots of vigor. Um, but that's why also when you're making your mixes, when you're going to the nutrient cycle, and we just say up here FPJ, well, think in your mind, okay, well, I can include a couple different FPJs in there. You know, half this one, half that one, and I'll get these different growths happening. Do you think that natural farming, it may already be there, but do you think it can get to a point where, where we say, oh, it's an iron deficiency, we need this FPJ? Yeah. So, so, um, so when you're talking about correcting deficiencies with natural farming, um, primarily the biology and getting, once you've got enough IMO for, like, you know, diverse biology, you shouldn't have these deficiencies. And when we're looking at FPJ, I largely compare it to food. So I'm not necessarily, like, like calcium, calphos, fish amino acid are to kind of change what's happening, whereas FPJ to me is more of a food. And then just like we have foods, you can eat a dessert, you can eat a main course, you can eat a poo poo, you can eat these different things and it will change your behavior, how you're going about it. But largely FPJ is a food. So, um, 
if you're having deficiencies feeding the biology or inoculating that biology, should correct the majority of that. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, what, what I've seen the most actually in that is human health. So we know different plants provide different things. Like you're talking about moringa to help combat diabetes. Well, shoot, ferment moringa and then eat that. And these different properties we know plants have in humans, I've seen the most effect. Because our animals are really weird. First, first the soil, you can put diversity out there. But to put diversity into me, it's like, where do you start? I gotta take someone Joe's poop and like, I don't know. People translate with healthy specimen and then transfer it. Um, you know, it's, it's different. Oh, Drake, good job explaining those three points. It really um, was magical and wonderful as always. But um, you're very humble and you give credit to all the giants. But um, did they say exactly those three things or did you come up with that particular three points? The three points. Um, the osmotic pressure, the uh, fermentation heat, and I forgot to write down the other thing. Sure. Sugar. Why, Third why, thing is the sugar. Sugar, yeah, sugar becomes food. Right. Yeah. Um, I spent a fair amount of time just like sitting and standing on my whiteboard and I write a bunch of things out that and I just sit there and stare at it. And then I also, um, you know, I, I've noticed in my own body how these things happen, but I, I don't think anyone's told me that. Maybe. Well, we just need to get that. Is there um, an ideal or like balanced ratio of fungal to bacterial in like a healthy soil, or is it dependent on what is growing in that soil? So, so that's a good question. Is there an ideal fungus to bacteria ratio, or does it change? Um, and it changes based on the crop you're growing. So things that are quick growing, fast, um, excuse me, like, like weeds, tend to be highly bacterial oriented. So if you want to grow a lot of weeds, bacterial oriented, you'll get tons of fire weed growing in your pasture. You know, you'll have um, medicinal plants growing really well. If you want to grow a old growth forest, you go look and they will have tons of fungus. It'll be highly fungally oriented. Old growth forest grows really slow, is in it to win it for the long run, and it tends to be more fungal oriented. So typically where we want to be is in the middle for our annual or annual or perennial crops. Kind of we want um, when, when Elaine talked about it, it was about 600 um, bacteria with 600 fungus, and that's biomass per gram, I think. Or, so I, I don't know the exact numbers, but she had a way of quantifying it. And um, so we want to be in, in the middle. What I found here in Hawaii is we're extremely fungal deficient, um, just in general. So it's almost always better to have more fungus in your IMO to inoculate it and then to see that happen. And I found the same IMO pretty much works for everything. It's it's then the mulch that you put on top that is the determining factor. So if I'm growing lettuce, I use the IMO 4, but then I put wood chips there, I'm going to slow down the growth of my lettuce versus I grow the lettuce and I put grass clippings there. Now my lettuce is going to do fine. If I'm growing fruit trees and I put a bunch of wood chips around in tandem with my IMO4, then I'm going to get even more fungal growth. So it's, it's, it's what's feeding your microbes once they're in your system, is what I found. But I'm not, like, like Joe was saying, do you spray um, If I was more on that, and really what, well, I don't want to say more on, um, <laughs> a less on is not to be a more on. Um, but making your spray equipment correct for you, and this is something I've, I've increased in my life lately, is I bought a sweet power sprayer to be able to go deal with my whole area I want to treat. Before that, I was like too picky and trying to do all kinds of this, you know, barefoot stuff. And shoot, and sometimes you just got to burn a little gas to get things done. 
and in the long run, uh, it's you know you're you're better off. What make of your power spray? Do you have uh, Mar Mariana's like yeah. Mariana, kind of 75p, but I, you know, I really should get a sponsorship from a Mariana before I start advertising them. Uh, sure. If you call them, tell them for it's essential. Yeah, uh, yeah um, I have a, a garden plot and have a, two rows of kalo, which aren't flowering, and I have a row of papaya. Um, water, I like different things that are close together. So if I spray a change over, what are my dangers of overspray onto other plants that are nearby if they're not meeting that specific nutrient? So, so one one thing. So that, that's a great question. You, you have two crops next to each other, and they're in different growth stages. What do you do? Um, and this, this, you know, when I go to Korea and I look, it's like one greenhouse all at the same stage and treating all the same things. So these formulas really make sense there. For me, I go out, I have polyculture plantings. It's just the way my garden set up, along the permaculture style of doing it. And so I got all these different stages. So what do I do? Well, that's why I'm here at the advanced training, because he knows all about this the most. What so far my advice has been is to alternate week by week. So one week I'm going to encourage this, the next week I'm going to encourage that, and and alternating between. Just like he was talking about the, you know, the baby gets chubby and skinny and chubby and skinny. Same things. Your plants. Your if, if you alternate back and forth and you make them more chubby one week and more flowering one week, you know, and you alternate back and forth. I found that, that to be effective. Um, but, you know, I'm not the expert. <coughs> Facebook and I realized people thought 
like people take me a little too literally, and they're like, oh, we can use Google, we can use Kahlo. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you can. You can use what's at your feet. You can use these things, these starches. And so that's why when I teach, I want to say, okay, so this question came up to me just now about the wine. Can I use wine from this specific part? What you need is a fermented, slightly alcoholic thing for rehydration. That's the general rule. Okay. Why do they, they use soju or, or makgeolli, actually? They use makgeolli? Yeah. Why do they use that? Well, it has, just like the rice, has certain principles that are really applicable. So the general rule is this. The specifics are that, and that's how I, I want to teach you. Now, if you go and you use what you got, do that, but then always teach the way that we've kind of learned and passed down, and there's, there's reason for that. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, now you're not adding as much sugar, and you think it's cool, but then your kids all of a sudden don't have these exudates anymore. They have crushed plant material, and they're like, why can't I grow, you know? And so we gotta pass down the, the lineage, but then you gotta use what works and make it applicable to your area. Um, So, um, so sometimes when you hear me say rice and stuff, you think, well, I, I'm not going to get rice. Well, pass the rice on, talk about this, know why you would use rice, but then use Udu or whatever. And, and in fact, I've seen guys collect it on Kahlo and then put it back on their Kahlo, and I think there's a lot of wisdom in that even. Mm -hmm. 